This week on a sleep deprived episode 305 of the anxious truth, we're going to talk about the value of learning how to do nothing. It's the act of doing, not doing. My friend Joanna Hardis is here to help us with that. So let's get into it right now. Hello, everybody. Welcome back to The Anxious Truth. This is episode 305 of the podcast or the YouTube channel, depending on where you're consuming this content. We are recording in November of 2024. In case you're listening from the future, today's topic aided by my friend, OCD specialist, Joanna Hardist from Cleveland, Ohio, is the value of learning how to do nothing, or as it's sometimes known, doing, not doing, and why we should probably invest time and effort in learning how to do that. If you are new to this podcast or this YouTube channel, this is the first day here, you kind of accidentally stumbled upon it, maybe in a YouTube or a Google search. Welcome. I'm glad that you're here. I am Drew Linsalata, creator and host of The Anxious Truth. I'm also a therapist, still practicing under supervision for the time being in New York, specializing in the treatment of anxiety and anxiety disorders. I'm also a former sufferer of all the flavors of anxiety disorder and depression and OCD for many years of my life on and off, but much better now for many years. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm an author. I've written three books on this topic. I'm a podcaster, clearly psychoeducator, mental health advocate, social media guy, all the things. But here on The Anxious Truth, we're talking about anxiety, anxiety disorders, and strategies for learning about it, understanding it, and starting to work on overcoming these problems. So welcome if you are new. Of course, if you're a returning listener or viewer, welcome back. I'm glad you're here. I hope you guys find today's episode helpful. What are we going to talk about? We're going to talk about the value of learning how to do nothing. Some people call it doing, not doing. If you're familiar with Taoism or Buddhism, you may have heard doing, not doing. I believe that comes out of Taoism. What are we talking about when I say that? If you have been around long enough around this podcast or the books that I write or the, the content that I create, you know that we talk all the time about learning how to not react automatically to anxiety symptoms, to panic attacks, to anxiety spikes, to scary thoughts if you happen to have OCD. We are learning how to not do anything about those things, how to surrender to them, how to willfully tolerate them. If you came here through the work of Dr. Claire Weeks, we're learning how to float and utterly, utterly accept, as she would say in her Australian grandma accent. And people will often say, okay, cool, I get why we'd want to do that, but what does that even look like? If you've ever wanted to know what does surrendering to anxiety or OCD or a panic attack look and feel like? Learning how to do nothing, like undertaking the formal practice of learning what nothing looks and feels like, can be really helpful because it helps you answer that incredibly common question. It may be completely out of the realm of your experience. You have no frame of reference for doing nothing because like any human being, especially in Western culture, we are constantly in problem solving and fixing mode. So doing nothing, the act of doing not doing is all about becoming aware of that habit and working on suspending it so that we go from doing, which can be overtly behavioral or just mental, mostly mental in our community, into a state of not doing or just being. This is about learning to stop fighting against reality because it's here, you have anxiety because you're listening to this podcast, clearly you are an anxious person, it's already here, you cannot deny that reality, so how can you work with it better? It's about learning how you are a habitual doer, problem solver, fixer, because we all are. And if we can gain an awareness of that through the practice of learning how to not do things, we do give ourselves a better chance of starting to learn new ways to interpret and relate to and be with our anxiety, our anxiety symptoms, our, even our panic attacks, our OCD, scary thoughts, things of that nature. And we just get kind of better at doing life. So learning how to do nothing is a really valuable skill. And today, my friend Joanna Hardis has joined me to have this discussion. Joanna is awesome. She's one of those people that I trust implicitly. She's very well trained. She's a very experienced and ethical therapist specializing in OCD and anxiety disorders out of Cleveland. We have worked together in the past and I can't think of a better person. I can think of one other person I would have brought in in this conversation, but it's hard to coordinate the schedules. But if there's a person to, that I want to talk about doing nothing with, that would be Joanna. So she is here to, uh, to help us out with the topic. Before I bring Joanna on, just a quick reminder, as always, The Anxious Truth is more than just this video or this podcast episode. There's a ton of more things 
all on my website at theanxioustruth.com. I'm not going to pitch you. Just head on over there if you want to check it out. Most of this stuff is free. All of it is at at least very low cost. I have nothing expensive there. The books are cheap. So you can either find the rest of the podcast episodes or the free social media stuff or all the content I've created, or you might avail yourself of some of the low-cost resources. But check it all out at theanxioustruth.com. I appreciate that. And if you're watching on YouTube, maybe like the video or subscribe to the channel. That's a way to support the work that I do. If you're listening on Apple Podcasts or Spotify, maybe leave a four or five star rating if you dig the podcast or write a quick review. That's another way to support the work that I do. And that costs you nothing, but it does help me out and therefore other people out a lot. And I appreciate all of you guys, no matter how you support the podcast, even if it's just hanging out, watching a video or listening now and then. So let's get to it. We're going to talk about the value of learning to do nothing. Let's bring Joanna on. And then at the end, I will come back and kind of put a bow on it as I always do. And I'll give you all the links and all the good places to go. So let's get to it now. Here we go. Come on, come along. Here we go. Joanna, what up? Andrew. It's been a while. It's been a minute since we did one of these, huh? It has been way too long. You're too busy for me. You're obviously too busy now. I, I, it's very hard to get on my calendar. I'm that exclusive now. <laughs> I'm joking. <laughs> you have, it really is. Cause it's been over a year. Oh, it's probably since we did one of these, like a podcast episode together, probably at least two years. I don't think we did one since I started my grad program. So no, no, you, you know, because when the book came out, oh, that's right. We did that. Speaking yeah. The book. What, what book did you write again? Oh, uh, just do nothing. Just do nothing. It's a good book people. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. The paradoxical guide to getting out of your way. If you go, I don't know what episode this is. I'm so woefully unprepared, but I will tell you right now that if you go to the anxious truth slash, this is episode 305. So if wow. you go to the anxious truth.com slash 305, I'll have links to join. The book. It's a really good book. I agree. And it matches with today's topic, which is doing nothing. Well, yes. before we hit the record button, Joanna was like, venting one of her little peeves to me, which, and she has such an entertaining list of pet peeves, but <laughs> when you write a book called just do nothing, I mean, we talked about it on a previous podcast episode. I'll link that also in the show notes. So you can listen to Joanna talk about that, but what, how do people misinterpret that? What do they think you mean when, when you they say, what do you mean do nothing? What, what does that mean? Well, what they, what the, oh, I, they'll come up to me. Oh, I love this. You're telling me that I don't have to do anything. I love it. Tell my wife that now I don't have to do anything. <laughs> and they miss, <laughs> it's like, I just shake my head because I'm not really telling people they miss the whole second part, which is the paradoxical guide to getting out of your way. Mm. Um, so they think what I'm advocating for is literally doing nothing like kicking back and, and, and just like, you know, watching sports all day or housewives or whatever, just doing nothing. And that's not really, I'm sure that's not what we're talking about today, even though you, um, I mean, that's it's not what I'm talking about. No, that's it's not, not how we get out of our way. Yeah. We're not literally talking about like, and you know what? It's funny because for people dealing with anxiety disorders with highly avoidant coping strategies, that could go off the rails really fast. So like these two people told me to do nothing cool. I'm just gonna stay home all day and just read. Right. Yeah. We're not talking about that. So right. I'm glad we got to clear that. This up. isn't early retirement, oh. which is also what I get a lot of. <laughs> Episode 305, early retirement. Which <laughs> Do nothing. Yeah, no, right. that's what we're talking about. So when we're talking about doing nothing, I mean, I have come to the conclusion that learning how to do nothing or like, you know, I think it's the Buddhist or the Taoist will say it's doing, not doing, you know, like learning how to be in not doing mode is one of those skills, like at least in the West, we should be teaching everybody from the time we're old enough to like toddle around the house. We should be learning how to not do, 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 do not do. Yeah. Yeah. Otherwise we're in constant doing mode all the time. And especially as adults, especially in a society that, you know, is always about improvement and achievement and goals and check boxes and all that stuff. We're always in behavioral doing mode, but then there's the mental doing mode too. What is, what does that look like for you? When you're in mental doing mode, we all do it, by the way. Well, even we do it. Both of us do it. Oh, yeah. What does it look like for me when I'm in mental doing mode? Yeah, you could be sitting like literally just sitting on your sofa, but still be in mental doing mode. What are oh, you doing? Oh, yeah. I'm thinking, I'm thinking, I'm planning, I'm, I'm replaying something, I'm, I'm daydreaming, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm on vacation somewhere else. I'm just like, 
you know, I, I'm, I'm in my head, you know, I'm in my head. Mm. And, you know, I think for me, the, all of those things, all of the things I get those, um, I also discovered, I think in the last few months it dawned on me like, oh, I'm in constant judging mode. Like mental doing is oh, yeah. like evaluating. Oh, and judging. evaluating. That's part of it. Yeah. Cause I'm, yeah. I'm deciding what I want and don't want. What do I like and don't like about this moment right now? Is this good? Yes. Like, how do I change it to get what I want? Like, how do I resist what is because I don't like what it is? And I, I want something different. Like, you know, very yes. excellent. We, we get in our own minds. Yes. That's doing mode. That's doing mode. That's difficult. Yes, yes, yeah. yes, yes. Even, even like, I, it's gray in Cleveland right now, and it's raining, and and I was a vet, like, you know, hating on the weather. Yeah, which is like, you could not like the. It's nothing wrong with not liking the weather, but how much time and effort do we like automatically put in yes. the, the resistance there? You yes. find yourself like overly hating the weather, or getting a little too carried away with hating on the weather. Yes. And, and then it's the, oh my gosh, it's the start of winter and oh my, it's the next five months and, and, and why am I still here? And I could have, why aren't I like spending the winter somewhere else? And it's like this whole story about the winter that I get into hmm. and I, and okay. clients okay. get into. Yeah. That's a tough one. So, yeah. and I think it's, it's human nature. We all do it. This isn't like, oh, you're broken if you do that. Cause we all do it by default. That's the way it goes. Brains aren't meant to be quiet. They're meant to be active. That's their job. Yeah. yeah. So I get it. One suggestion would be to just come to Long Island for the winter. Cause you know, it's very tropical and sunny here in the winter. Yeah. I'm lying. It's not. <laughs> no, I know it's not. <laughs> We're both screwed. But isn't it funny how like you look out the window or you get up and you check the weather and momentarily you do have an opinion about the weather, which is okay. But then that goes into like a 90 seconds or two minutes of unconscious, like, Oh, you know, it'd be so much better to be in Florida or someplace warm. I hate it. This sucks. Like now I have to get my winter clothes out. And now you're living in February already where you have seasonal affective disorder and you, you want to like, you know, you're, you're like no motivated sitting on the sofa overeating. Like, wait, wait a minute. What just happened? Exactly. Yeah. And then I'm on a tangent in my own head about just, you know, seasonal affective disorder. Do I know how to like, is that real? How much of that is real? How do I treat it? Like I can just like go on and on in my own head. And I have a like fairly consistent meditation practice. And then I'm hating, then I'm like, why, you know, I know how to, like, I have a pretty good mindful awareness practice. Like, how am I getting lost in this shit so regularly that I'm like being critical of myself? Like, it's so, yeah. This is so relatable. Uh, yeah. Same thing. We are very similar. Like I yeah. practice every day. I'm actually doing the whole MBSR teacher training thing. So I'm spending, I'm literally spending a lot of time every day doing the exercises. This morning, I'm in the middle of like mindful yoga. I'm supposed to be concentrating on how my body feel the movement in space and zoning. And I'm no joke. This is legit. I found myself wondering if you had new glasses because I haven't seen you in a long time. We haven't recorded. And I'm like, oh, I wonder if she has new glasses. What a random, ridiculous thought. Like, I'm really not worried about your glasses, but I know you wear glasses. And yeah. my mind went to like, oh, yeah, I'm going to record later with Joanna. Like, I wonder if she has new glasses. <laughs> I don't know why I thought that, but I did. And yeah. it was like, I don't know how long my brain was there. So I'm doing yeah. yoga, but my mind is literally thinking about your eyewear. I mean, come on, brain. Really? Yeah. It's yeah. so funny. So I think it's okay to acknowledge that our brains are built to be in constant doing mode, but that can get us into trouble because now we're problem solving where we don't need to be. And for me, my, my take, the reason why I think we should all learn how to just be, which is the opposite of doing, just being is like life is full of realities that we don't really want or like, but we can't do anything about them. And then when we're in doing mode, behaviorally and mentally, we're resisting what is. Right. But I think for a lot of clients, and I think this is where it may be different for you and I, because mm -hmm. we're at a different point in our recovery. I hear from a lot of clients they are ter like they're they're ter I hear all the time. I'm I'm scared to be alone with my thoughts. Yeah. Oh yeah. Hundred percent. Like so, when we introduce mindfulness practice into say therapy, I do have clients that are like, I mean, they want to, but they're also really surprised at how difficult it is to hear that thinking, actually hear it. Yeah. So I think it's the question of 
it may be it may sound really great in theory and people may be like oh yeah it's totally i'm down with what they're saying but what is the obstacle that gets in someone's way whether it's like you know people think it's just an absolutely unproductive use of their time these relentless optimizers mm -hmm. Or people who are just terrified of being alone with their thoughts. Yeah. Or, you know, it's someone who says, like, I can't possibly sit still or, you know. So I think that that is, you know, something that we, you know, that figuring out what it is for whatever individual person. Mm. That is a, those are con the common obstacle. I'm just afraid to be, my, especially we're treating people with anxiety disorders. That's a big deal. I'm going to mm -hmm. hear my intrusive thoughts. I'm going to hear the scary thoughts. I'm going to hear the cat catastrophic thoughts. Yeah, true. Even for non-anxious people that don't have anxiety disorders, it's really difficult for them to sit and hear their thoughts. And I think the other thing that they wind up doing, and whether they're anxious or not, I, I know for most of my clients that start to try this stuff, it is, well, I can't, I'm not, I'm, it doesn't, it's not working. I'm not, it's the expectation of what it's supposed to be. Like, but you don't understand, like 10 minutes into it, my mind was wandering and I was just worried about what I was going to make for dinner. I'm like, yeah, I know that's, that's the practice. It's okay. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yes. This doesn't, this doesn't work for me. Right. It doesn't work. This isn't going to work for me. Yes. Yeah. What do you think the misconception is about? Like when you'd say like, Hey, we really need to learn how to go into not doing mode. What, what is the biggest misconception about what that's supposed to do that you find? I think that people either believe that they're supposed to, that, that, that they still are in an outcome mode, that, that they're supposed to come out of it um, because they see all this bullshit on social media that they're supposed to be calm. Mm -hmm. And afterward, they're going to be like, you know, zen out or calm or relaxed. And when they're not, they that they think that it, it, oh it, it, that it, it was a waste of time. Yeah, it's because a, they're not calm. Right, because they're looking for a particular outcome. Right. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Versus that, you know, mindfulness is the work. <laughs> like it is. It yeah. is. And, you know, I, that's why I think of it as a as a fitness skill. Like it's a mental fitness skill. Mm -hmm. And it's work to constantly, um, and that's why I like this, it's that when people call it attention training, because you have to constantly train your brain to come back. Yeah. Yeah, you find these principles in a lot of different, if we're just talking about like therapy and treatment, like they're in a lot of therapies for sure. You know, uh, metacognitive therapy is a, a big component of that is attention training. It doesn't look like traditional meditation and mindfulness, but it's the same thing. I think it is anyway. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 And I think... It's work, but I think if someone is going into it and they and they and 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 they're expecting something, but again, that's the doing mode mm -hmm. that they have an expectation of how they're supposed to come out of it. Yeah, I agree. I think they're either looking for like a state. This is supposed to make me calm, or this is how I quiet my mind. The number one question people ask me, oh, you meditate all the time? Yeah, I have a daily practice I have for many years. How do you quiet your mind? Well, I don't. <laughs> like yes. Often I don't. The, it, the practice of not learning how to be non-judgmentally with your noisy mind is the practice. That's the, if there's a goal, that's what it is. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Can I just be aware of the fact that my mind is noisy and that's okay? Right. Yes. Right. Yeah. Because those are kind of, I don't know if they're the same people, but also people that when they're it, when they notice that they're really anxious, and then they'll say, "Well, in that moment, I tried meditating," and it's like, "No, no, no." <laughs> that was me. I was a compulsive meditator when I was at my worst. Yeah, I was trying to meditate it away, and that got so frustrating. So, yeah, that's not what we use this for at all. Yes. If you're, yes. You're, if you're listening to this, odds are you're dealing with a chronic or disordered anxiety problem. No, do nothing is not a technique that makes your anxiety go away at all. Yes, yes. Mm. The other thing that I found really interesting, and look, we're but you, we talk about this all the time, you and I, when we get on our phone calls and just rant. But the messages that surround things like being present, I, I being present is that is a key part of it. That's correct, but like that gets twisted into an aesthetic almost, like. Being mindful and doing the practice of doing, not doing does not have an aesthetic. It does not have a look. 
It does not have a lifestyle. I mean, actually, I don't know if that's true because what I'm learning in MBSR training is it is a little bit of a lifestyle. It's borderline cultish. We'll talk about that some other day. But at the same time, like there's no aesthetic, there's no goal, there's no outcome. It doesn't have to look or feel a certain way. We're trying to learn to just be aware that we're always thinking, doing, and feeling lots of different things. And that's okay. Like it's the awareness mm -hmm. of the machine. We start to learn. If you learn to do, not do, you start to be able to watch the machine work without getting swept away by it. Right. Right. And then you were, I think, you know, this is the hard, it's kind of, and because I feel like this is the first step is like being able to observe, being able to observe, you know, kind of the circus that goes on internally, mm -hmm. and then being able to live your life while all of this stuff is happening. Yeah, that that's exactly true. Can I, we always talk about things like, can you bring the feeling with you? Yes. Because it's here anyway, trying yes. to make it go away isn't really working. So can you bring it with you? But you got to be able to do that by gaining an awareness of it first. It's like, yes. well, I'm having these thoughts, I'm having these feelings, or maybe, you know, this sort of work is used for people who deal with injuries or chronic pain, even terminal illness. Like, yeah, my back is killing me. I keep resisting it, but how can I work with it instead of trying to fix a thing I cannot fix instantly. So that's right. really important. But I think it's it's building the awareness that like, oh, look, I'm trying to fix it. I'm fighting it. And that's making things worse for me. I have no shot if I try to fight reality. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Right. Interesting. One of the things that I, I found that, and I brought this up in one of the, the classes, and I'm taking these classes, but, you know, well, what, did, what you know, came up for you? What surprised you? And one of the things that I said was, how come so many, because you're using guided as part of the mindfulness training curriculum, sometimes you're using guided recordings that the instructor has given you at first. You know, that's the first way you get into it. I'm like, how come two of them ended with gratitude? That's That didn't seem right to me. Like if I'm going to be really, because that's that thing, I'm supposed to come out of it feeling calm. I should, I should be able to have a sense of gratitude and thanks. I'm like, but do we? How come at the end of the recording, you're instructing us to be grateful? Mm -hmm. Isn't that trying to make a feeling? So even in people who train for three years to get that certification to teach this skill might default back to, and it was interesting. It was just like, oh, didn't even think about that. So interesting. But then I'll hear other instructors that will say things like, well, as you end the practice, just take a moment to acknowledge that you just did this. Cool. I like that. Yes, so I like that. Neutral, right? Like I might feel yeah. grateful or I might feel happy. I might feel proud of myself or I might feel nothing or I might feel like I just wasted 45 minutes of my life. Either way, it's okay, right? Right. I, I like that. That's funny. I did that training in 2005. It's no joke. It's now three years. It's longer to get the MBSR complete certification as a teacher than it is for me to get my or you to get your master's degree, right? It's oh, my gosh. It's, I, it's really a long program now. I'm not going three years, by the way. So. Oh, I did a week at Omega. Oh, I got to sign up for that, clearly. <laughs> oh, I went to Omega for a week with John Kabat-Zinn and Saki Santorelli yeah. and did a week training. Yeah. I, mean, but I wasn't it, certified. I'm not certified. Well, I don't know if they, maybe they didn't have that back then. We're off on a tangent a little bit, but it yeah, really surprised me. Yeah. So yeah. I'm like, wow, three years of training for that. There's a, there's a certificate, there's a qualification to be a teacher after a year, but it's still a year. It's not a, yeah, that's oh. intense. Yeah. It's wow. Intense. Okay. So, back on track. Okay. But anyway, the point is even people who teach this can accidentally fall into yeah. trying to create an outcome. So right. it's so normal for us to want to do that. It's just our human nature. It's okay. Yeah. Yeah. So what do we do? You know, what do we do when we find ourselves looking for that outcome and then judging what it's supposed to be and then it's not that and then we don't want to do it? What do you do when you get frustrated with it? When I get frustrated, when I get frustrated that I'm when I get frustrated that I'm looking for an outcome. Yeah, because I think no matter how long we practice, we get stuck in that. Right. I mean, people wear robes and move to monasteries and try to dedicate their lives for this. And if they're honest, they'll tell you at 80 years old, I still don't have it right. Like I'm still failing. Yeah. It. So like, what do you do when you find that like, oh, I, I accidentally did get caught up in an outcome or I spent my entire 45 minutes off and God knows where in my head. Right. What's the key there. I mean, I am really trying and I and I mean, I get so many opportunities because I fail so often. <laughs> oh, 
because <laughs> yeah. I am so self-critical of myself. I am really, really trying to like be kind, be kinder to myself that like, okay, you know, I, or, like, I acknowledge that like I am human. Mm. Eight times out of 10, I, you know, <laughs> it may not work, but two times out of 10, I am getting better at saying, you know what, I'm human. I, like, I, I can't punish myself. Like, I'm catching it, I'm noticing it, and I'm human. Cool. Okay. I mean, two, out of, two times out of 10 is better than zero times out of 10. Yes. Yeah. And I'm really trying to say, like, there is nothing, like, uh, there's nothing wrong with me. Like, I'm human. I'm really, you know, and this is something I'm working on. Yeah. That what you just said, I think is so important, you know, learning to do nothing or learning the, the art of doing, not doing, which uh, we'll get to the particulars, I think, and how, what that sort of looks like for people. But you are, you're not in the midst of an anxiety disorder. And even you have to remind yourself, I'm human. It's okay to not do this right. Cause there even is no right. So for somebody who's trying to feel better and there's no, it's okay to want to feel better. We're not saying that you shouldn't want that. But it's so easy to instantly take a practice like this and treat it as a technique or really want the outcome so much that you get critical of yourself. And then you say you're even more broken and you can't do it and you're failing. That's such a trap in this. Yeah. I don't notice it as much when I'm, I'm, I'm pretty good when I do a seated, a seated meditation mm -hmm. of being kind to myself when I notice that I'm like, when I notice and I label like mind wandering to bring it back and be, I, I'm really good. But when I'm working on a behavior change, yeah, like tough, with, right? this, with this pickleball that you and I have talked about before, I am so hard on myself about like, you know, <laughs> making a mistake or like anything that I do wrong. So I am really trying to, Joanna, like you're hu like you're human. You're allowed to you're allowed to be anxious. You're allowed to avoid. You're allowed to bail mm. and make mistakes. Like you're human. It, it's okay. And isn't that part of the whole psychological flexibility thing, though? Like I can be there. Yeah. I can be there with that too. So I can be anxious. I could be upset. I could be feel like I'm failing. I could not feel so good about myself today. That's allowed too. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And I've had some really like terrible behavior on that court. Um, and with people saying like, aren't you a therapist? And like, that makes it what? even worse. I feel like <laughs> you want to start watching the Cleveland news. Cause you might be on there soon. I don't know. I no, feel it's just like me leaving, like walking out and stuff, but, <laughs> but like really, and I am so hard on myself. Like I should be, you know, whatever we don't, this is not my therapy session, but but really leaning into, you know, trying to be kinder as I make, you know, because I'm hitting up against a lot of distress and like really trying to like leave the internal stuff there and not do anything with it, which is some there's of what we were talking about. Yeah, there's the not doing, learning yeah. how to not do, right? The, the skill of not doing is not, sometimes it's physically not doing, you're right, I'm just going to sit. Yeah. That's one of my favorite things is, no, 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 I get 15 minutes now to sit on my silly little cushion and not do, I'm allowed to not do any, this is an exercise and literally not, there's no goal. Just, yes. I'm just that, just, that yeah. yes. I find uh, that is easier for me than, than the next step, which is taking it out into yeah, the world. I agree. But, but you build that. Yes. In that sort of formal practice. And that's why, yes. you know, we'll get into this a little bit more now, but I think in that situation, so you're struggling at pickleball ball because you want to have a certain outcome and you can't get it and you get frustrated. Yes. And judge. That's where the skill of not knowing to not do is the mental skill. Oh, wait, yes. I am mentally trying to problem solve this instead right. of just like, this is what I got today. Maybe tomorrow I'll be better or worse. I don't know. Right. But that's all allowed. Yeah. Right. You're learning that, that being right. aware of this, like, oh, I'm mentally problem solving pickleball. Right. Yeah. yeah. But I think for a lot of people, the physically not doing. It's hard. Yeah. And yeah. it's hard for parents to not to just have unstructured time with their kids. That's true too. Yeah. You find it in school, in work, in parenting, in relationships. Yes. Like down not doing time is so valuable. And you know what? There's been so much written about this lately too. The idea that we have forgotten how to be bored. We've forgotten how to be idle because we we don't have to be anymore. 
And then the ability to just be in a situation for whatever it is without judging it, we have lost that. We're collectively losing that. Yes. And I think you and I are a similar age. Like we get as kids, we did have to learn how to be idle and bored. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Whereas now kids don't have to ever be, my kids never had to be bored. Your kids probably never had to be bored. We had quiet time. See that you're smart. Yeah. You were teaching them how to be bored or how to be idle. <laughs> They, they hated it. The, the third one never had quiet time. Um, but the older two had quiet time where they couldn't have TV, they couldn't have electronics, and they had to just do like figure out what the, what the hell they wanted to do. <laughs> if your kids are listening, if Joanna's kids are listening to this podcast, I'm sorry, your mom was so mean. No, yeah, <laughs> seriously. Um, it, There's value in that though, you know. But as a, even if as adults, if you didn't learn it and you never, you don't know what it is to be idle and quiet and still, you can learn it now. It doesn't matter how old you are. You can still learn yeah. it. Hey, never too late. Don't you, do you, I mean, other than sitting on your cushion, do you ever do, do you, I mean, what do you do for it? Well, what I've gotten better at over the last, I'm a year or so in my practice, I guess. And now I'm only in the beginning of the training, MBSR training, but like it is an eye opening thing after only four or five weeks. So I'm, I'm very beginner at that, but being able to, I'm starting to bring it into other areas. Like I am a food as fuel guy. I am not a foodie. I will cook sometimes, but I don't care how it comes out. I'm that. Now right? we've fair, talked about this. Yeah, fair enough. And I know I'm weird that way. I get it, but that's the way I am. Bringing it into eating has turned into an interesting experience too, because now I see how mindless I am on that, and it's not helping me. So, for instance, I learned this caused a lot of chuckling in my house. The breakfast I make is absolutely awful. I eat, I'll eat it anyway and not care. I'll just woof it down and like, okay, I'm done eating, but I'm also reading a book or I'm listening to a podcast or I'm checking my email at the same time. That is not helping me at all. So learning that and bringing it into eating now and then I'm not a mindful eater by habit and I'm mm -hmm. not be, I, I accept that about myself really taught me that like I'm using a thing that's supposed to be good for me, fueling my body. And it could be a little five or 10 minute break for my mind and a recharge was making things worse in my day, adding to the stress, adding to the load. Like what the hell's going on? And, and I was eating crap. So like mm. all, all I have to do is cook it like two more minutes and maybe put a little seasoning. Oh, the horror. It's an extra 10 seconds and it's even enjoyable. Wow. What an eye opener. How did I miss that? <laughs> How did I, I was like today days old when I discovered that I'm eating a terrible breakfast <laughs> and being okay with that. Makes no sense, right? Yes. Yeah. So it's not like making a huge life change. No, these are little tiny things here and there. The other night, I it was a really long day, came home, and all I wanted to do was chill. And it's even funny because learning the skill and practicing it is work. I had to motivate myself to sit on a cushion. How ridiculous does that sound? It's 8 o'clock at night, and I want to do a night practice. I know it's good for me. I really want to do it because I like the practice, but also I'm tired, and I just want to zone out and numb out. I could not. I had to motivate myself to sit down. Come on, man. <laughs> this is how no, you think. Yeah. yeah. But I also broke a box of light bulbs accidentally in my garage, and I was ready a long day, and I just wanted to get to the point where I could numb out. And in that moment, the skill of doing nothing came in handy because I didn't rant and rave and stomp around the garage for 35 or 60 minutes and then numb myself out scrolling YouTube or, or Instagram for three hours. I was recognizing what I was doing. This happened. I, I dropped the, I dropped the light bulbs. What can I do? I can clean it up. Yeah. Ranting and raving and mentally problem solving and judging the experience would have made it much worse for me in the past. Right. Yeah. So that's where it's showing up for me behaviorally, but it's a really <laughs> not consistent. It's hard. It is hard. It yeah. is hard. But I think people can make those little micro shifts mm -hmm. where they are just doing one thing even. Like even if someone just walks the dog, but they don't, you know, they don't listen to something. Right. Just they, walk the dog. They just walk the dog. Yep. Yep. If you're going to make a cup of tea, just make the tea. That's it. Right. Don't, don't multitask. Which again, like you have to be you really learn to be flexible when you do this because your brain will try to multitask and that's okay. If you catch it, come back to making the tea. 
But the intention there would be whether you intend to sit on a meditation cushion for 15 or 40 minutes or an hour, or however long you can do, or you intend to just make a cup of tea, which takes you three minutes. That's the intention. I'm going to just make this tea. Then your brain will wander off and you come back to the tea, the tea making or the dog walking. That's practice. Yes. Counts. Right. Mm. What about identity? I, I always find identity issues come up too. You said that earlier, like, yeah, but that feels like, but I'm not accomplishing. I'm the doer. I take care of everybody. I'm the problem solver. I'm the, I'm the multitasker. I multitask. I'm so good at multitasking. Are you know? You know, so sometimes it can, you're confronting issues of like, but I, I'm, I'm, not, I'm always supposed to be doing that's correct to do Why are you telling me it's wrong. But then we would ask why you listen to this podcast. Right. And I, you know, how well is it? At what cost are you multitasking? Yeah. I always ask people like at what cost? And if you're a parent, what, you know, what are you mirroring for your kids? Because most parent, most parents want their kids to be able to play independently, to be able to focus, to be able to do all these things. And then if we're not able to model it, it's very hard. We wonder why our kids struggle so much to focus and to just do one task other than like, you know, scroll YouTube or whatever they're doing. Yeah. I mean, and that's a very real thing. We all know that problem in real life, whether it's with young people or adults, it's almost universal. Like, no, it's yeah. just the default. I, what do you mean? I, I want to, can I just have my iPad? Well, what, right. if you just, what if you do sit silently for just five minutes? Could you do it? Yeah. Yeah. But again, we go back to the beginning. The first thing is like, no, no, what is, why would I sit silently to practice it, to practice it, not to quiet your mind, not to calm down, not to have some sort of insight. Maybe you will, who knows, but like, it's just the practice of at least considering the possibility that not doing just being is valuable. And I think we've totally forgotten that generally speaking in our society. Yeah. And being curious. I mean, I think like curious about what can come up. Like, I think you can get, I mean, great idea. You can get an idea who, you know, great things can come when we just let ourselves be. Yeah. What I find people sometimes discover is that when they cultivate this, and believe me, there's no experts in my life. I do not know anybody that would call themselves an expert at this. We're, even if things don't come up in the silent time or the quiet time, you get more room moment to moment as you're living your day for stuff to pop up that could be productive. Or suddenly you find that you're being more, you're not trying to be more productive, but you are. Right. You're not trying to like be less anxious, but somehow you are because you're able to notice like, oh, I'm having a sensation in my body. What if I don't try to problem solve it? What happens? <gasps> Things happen like that you don't expect then. It's good. Yeah. yeah. Right. Yeah. I mean, yeah. that's why people with uh, things like chronic pain, they learn these type of skills. Like what if I don't problem solve my back pain right now? What happens to it? And they will report lower subjective pain experiences. And it, it, oh, I don't know, there are times when it fades away. Like, Good things happen when we practice this. Yeah, you're putting that space. Yes, that's exactly right. It's it's the building of the awareness that I'm problem solving my back pain or my knee pain or my anxiety or my racing heart. I'm problem solving it. Oh, I can see what I'm doing now. Yeah. No, yeah. I might make a different choice. What if I just let it be there? Right. Yeah. It's that thing that we've talked about. I think we've talked about it on other podcasts that you're, it's the difference between making, then you're able to make, instead of an emotion or a fear-based decision, mm. you're able to do a values-based decision. Yeah, hundred percent. Lately, I've heard it described as a difference between reacting, which is like automatic and mindless and responding, which has some thought behind it. Mm -hmm. It doesn't mean responding is always positive and always productive but at least you have a better chance of going in a productive or positive way than if, if you just automatically, just, I just respond, knee jerk. D don't like fix, don't like fix, don't like fix. You have no shot then. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So what will you tell somebody that, well, okay, you know what? You guys have sold me on this. I, maybe I want to learn how to start to learn how to do not doing. Where do you start? What would you tell somebody? Uh, you know, I, I start very small. Two minutes, like two to th two to three minutes. Mm -hmm. 
of um and and i typically will use something more like an attention training because i have found in doing this work if i say mindfulness based meditation or something i like there's it, it, eyes roll that's a good point i'm going to use that too thank you yeah. i just learned something smart yeah i mean i just feel like it, the word has so much like it, it just me it, it, i get too much so attention training and so really training that once you start to notice that your attention is getting hijacked you, you know bring it back to whatever your anchor is and so we will practice it in session mm -hmm. so if your anchor is your breath or the spot on the wall or, or whatever it is, you just keep coming back. Yeah. For, you know, two minutes. I like that. I like, I like attention training because you're right. When you say things like mindfulness or meditation, sometimes the connotations and the prejudgments are there. Oh, I yeah. try meditation doesn't work. Everybody tells you to meditate my anxiety way. No, 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 no. Let's just, all right, let's just work on awareness first. How's that? Yeah. You know, and so there's so many videos uh, that I don't, you know, they don't particularly like it just doesn't um, I've, I don't know, I've, I've never really like um, gotten into them. But online on YouTube, there's a tons of attention training mm -hmm. with sound that yes. people can access where, you know, you have to pay attention to one sound and then they put another sound in that. But I just do two to three minutes that when you notice that your attention is being, you know, hijacked, just bring it back. I love and, it. And set a timer. And, you know, three minutes is, it's a small enough amount. It's like a lightweight. Yeah. Yeah, that's exactly right. And people will often wonder like, well, how long do you sit for? Well, I can do 45 minutes. You know, I've never done an hour. I've never done that. I don't always do 45 minutes. 10, 15 minutes is fine for me. But that yeah, would be yeah, like I mean, a very long time for a person who's never done it. I wouldn't have been able to do 15 minutes back then. And I think the data, like I, when I was reading Peak Mind by Amishi Jha, which I love that book, 12 minutes is what the a lot of the research showed that if you really want the changes in your brain, you, you know, I think you need like five or five days a week at 12 minutes a day, which I think is you know, that's more palatable for people. I don't know that, you know, people, you know, 45 minutes, I feel like is so that's so, asking a ton. It really is. You're really buying into a lifestyle change, but you don't have to do that. I am with you. I have people who start with 30 seconds a minute. If that's all they think they can tolerate, it's okay to do that. Absolutely. Get it in four or five times a day then. That's fine. That's yeah. all right. Yeah. And I believe in her book, um, and she's the, she, that book is so interesting. She's the one who's done all the research with um, the armed forces. Oh, cool. Okay. Bringing um, attention training, mindfulness-based meditation to the armed forces. Really interesting. Peak mind. Um, it, she does 12 minutes. Yeah, that's not a lot. That's doable, right? I mean, maybe for a beginner, it's not, but you could get to 12 minutes. Yeah. And yeah. she starts smaller. And, you know, I think what's great about that is part of the practice is just, you know, you're allowed, there's no outcome here. And even if you suck at it for 12 minutes, you're allowed to try this for 12 minutes. It's okay. It's safe to not problem solve your anxiety or your OCD. It's safe to let go. It's safe to stop recovering. It's safe to be not productive. That's just by itself, just taking the 12 minutes or the three minutes is, yeah. that's a good start. I'm allowed to do this. I'm allowed to try this for three minutes. That's allowed. Right. Yeah. I mean, most people are engaging in so many behaviors that are, you know, that are making their anxiety or their, you know, their OCD or their anxiety disorder so much worse. Mm. And, you know, t you know, so something has to give. Yeah. And, and it's that there's so many lessons. We could talk about this. We could do a whole series on this. Oh my gosh. Honestly. Yes. Yeah. We've uh, talked about doing, yes. I know. Like we could keep doing a bunch of these things. But I, I think in the end, it is the lessons for me is learning what it acts. So when people say, I don't understand, how do I learn to surrender? How do I learn to tolerate? How do I learn to stop fighting? This is how you learn. This is a key part to me in how you learn. So you have to almost be willing to say, like, you know, this doesn't, I don't think I could do nothing. I don't understand the idea. Of course I have to do something. But if that's not working for you, 
I think it's really important to do this kind of work because this teaches you what it feels like to let go, to not solve it, to not fight it, to not manipulate it, to not try to control it. How do you even know what that feels like? When people ask people like you and I, well, what does it even look like? I don't understand. You're telling me that I have to let my heart race, for instance, or I have to have that scary thought and just let it be there. What does that even look like? Well, clearly what you're telling me is you have no reference for what not doing is even like, which many people in the West don't have. Here's a way to start to look at that, to, to right. start to look through that lens. It's and not that, specific to your anxiety or your OCD, but it's a way to start to at least put that lens in front of you so you can look through the do nothing lens. Right. And my feeling is if you can like get a glimpse of that, like mm -hmm. this is the first step. If you can get a glimpse of how to do that as you sit there, as you sit and you get a glimpse of how you become an observer and you just observe then we begin to add, we begin to get that process and then we add in a little bit more distress to it and then it's the same process but then we add in more and more distress as we begin to take that out from the mat into the world yeah so it, it has application even though it might be if nothing else if you take anything out of the last 40 minutes it's can I at least consider that this thing where I learn how to literally learn how to do nothing and practice doing nothing, maybe it does have a value. What if you at least consider the possibility that it might have some sort of value? That, that's all I would ask people to take away from this. Right. Because this is the formal sitting on the cushion or the sitting on the floor is the formal practice. But the informal is how we then put it into the how we then take those that awareness into the world, which I think is the value, you know, part of the next step. Yeah. So if you, you know, you work with Joanna and she tries to teach you how to do three minutes of attention, you know, just paying attention, it would be very easy to do a little eye roll or just immediately dismiss it, prejudge it. Like this isn't going to work. How is this ever going to calm me down? It's not supposed to just give it a chance. So yeah. one of the more interesting things, and I, I guess we'll wrap up that I, I get out of the whole MBSR training thing is when people do the formal eight week MBSR thing, which they could do at UMass or any number of places that does that, what they're really told is like, you need to have beginner's mind on this. Like, I know you might judge it as this isn't going to work. You don't have to like it. You don't even have to get a, re get a response or a, re a result from it. All we ask is if you commit to it, do it for the eight weeks and then tell us at the end of eight weeks what it was. How's that? So same thing. Just do the three minutes, try it. And then see what it looked like and then do it again and again. And, and often as you, and you know what, in two weeks you may decide mm, I'm out. Okay. But at least you tried it. Yeah. So fair enough. Right. Yeah. Fair enough. Anything you want to add to uh, sort of end the discussion? I don't think so. How can people find you, my friend? They can find me on my website, joannahardis.com. Will you link it so I don't have to spell it? I will definitely. It's super annoying when I have to spell it. What episode did I say this was? 305. So if you go to theanxiousstruth.com slash 305 or you're on YouTube or you're listening as a podcast, I will link it in the description. Yeah. So. And can I plug that I have a free mini course that people might be interested in? So it's a free mini course that might help people get unstuck. Ooh. And um, it is six videos over the course of 10 days where I walk you through how to make a small behavioral change. And maybe your small behavioral change is you want to start a three minute attention training practice. I, I'm going to sign up for that. Let me be very clear. You guys on social media, you hear me kind of poo poo all the time, the courses and the stuff. This person sitting on video with me right now, I trust implicitly. This oh, is that is so kind, Drew. Yeah. I appreciate it. Jo Joanna that. is not. She is as ethical as they get. This is not a, ooh, how can I make $2 million selling shitty courses to people? She ain't doing that. So no. go check it out. Free, I'm not even make. how could I make $2 million? Anyway, thank you, my friend. We'll do more of these. I miss doing them with you. So. I know, this is so fun. It always is. Um, guys, if you stay tuned, I will come back and do a little wrap up like I always do with more links and everything. And uh, yeah, see you guys later. Thank you. All right. And we are back in the studio, which as you can see, I had the same silly baseball cap on. I'm still looking pretty sleep deprived. I'm in the exact same place that I was like 10 seconds ago. So there is no studio. It's just my desk. It's fine. You're used to this by now. But I hope you enjoyed the conversation with Joanna. Again, I cannot stress enough. Joanna is somebody that I trust implicitly. She knows her stuff. And she was a great guest to have to talk about this topic. We're going to cover this more 
in the future for sure. We'll fill in some details. We may offer some programs on this to help you learn a little bit more about it or try it out. Talking about that, I don't know what it's going to look like, but we'll see. If you want to know more about Joanna, if you're watching on YouTube, I will put a link to her website in the video description. I'm going to pop it up on the screen right now. If you're watching the video, if you're listening on a podcast app, look at the podcast description. I'll link to her website. Also, it's joannahardis.com. Or if you're on my website at theanxioustruth.com slash 305, listening, watching, or reading the show notes, there'll be a link on this page to joannahardis.com as well. You can check out all of her cool stuff, follow her on social media, check out the book that she wrote, which is literally called Just Do Nothing. And it speaks to this particular topic, but she's, she's one of the good ones for sure. She's not trying to take advantage of anybody and she's not trying to sell you snake oil. So go check out my friend, Joanna. And if you hook up with her in any way, just tell her I sent you. And that is episode 305 of the anxious truth in the books. I don't think I'm going to do the music thing, or maybe I will. We'll see how I feel when I edit all this, but remember like there is something to the learning to do nothing. It is a valuable thing. Joanna includes it in the work that she does with her therapy clients. I include it in the work I do with my therapy clients. And if you're thinking, cool, I learn how to instantly calm down or shut down my scary thoughts, mm, got to back away from that a little bit, align your expectations a little bit more in line with what it's supposed to actually do. Maybe open up to the experience of learning something that has a longer term benefit that might even go beyond recovery from your anxiety disorder. But I think it's worth looking into. So consider what you've heard today and maybe poke around a little bit more to see what else you can learn about it and maybe try it for yourself. Uh, Joanna and I may be working on some programs on that, that will give you a little more information or a little opportunity to practice with us. We will see how that works out. Probably more coming on that in the new year in 2025. So stay tuned for that. But, uh, yeah, that's about it. Maybe here I will put in the music. Anyway, we'll be back in two weeks with another podcast episode. This one's going to have a special guest that I'm a little bit starstruck about. So come back in two weeks and you'll see who that is. It's going to be pretty informative. Uh, if you're watching on YouTube, maybe like the video, subscribe to the channel, leave a comment. I have, I have not commented back to you guys in like six weeks, but I promise I am going to go back. Hopefully next week I will have time to answer my YouTube comments. If you're listening on Apple Podcasts or Spotify or someplace that lets you rate a review, leave a more five star rating. If you dig the podcast and thinks it deserves, think it deserves that. Maybe take time and write a review because it helps more people find the podcast, and then more people get help. And that's why I talk into this silly microphone to begin with. And if you're looking at learning how to do nothing and using it as part of your recovery strategy, remember that it's okay to not be good at it. It's okay to not even be sure that it's going to work for you. Even just the act of opening up to that experience and considering it, trying it is a small step in the right direction. And you always have to give yourself credit for small steps in the right direction, no matter how tiny they are or how insignificant you think they are. They do add up if you're willing to learn the lessons that they give you. So thanks for listening. We'll see you again or watching. See you again in two weeks. Take care of yourself. And uh, yeah, we'll be back again. We're out.